good evening and very good afternoon to our guest speaker today. I welcome one and all present here. I, Madhu Pawa, from IBSA headquarters, Mumbai, is privileged to host today's webinar on evolution of anesthesia by Dr. Ved Abhay Vedya, a retired consultant anesthetist from National Health Service UK. Yes, you all heard me correctly. We are having an international fame personality whose younger brother of our trustee chairman, Dr. Sunita Mahajan. We also call her as Dr. Asha Mahajan. Along with that, we welcome Dr. Supriya also for today's webinar. Before we go ahead, I would like to introduce my organization, Indian Women Scientists Association, commonly known as IFSA. IFSA is a non-political, non-profit, voluntary social organization, which is registered in 1973. It is an organization formed by women scientists for women upliftment and empowerment. Our aim is to spread scientific temper in day-to-day -day life of the society. The headquarter is at Vashi Navi, Mumbai. We have 2,500 members all over India. IFSA has 11 branches in India, that is Amravati, Baroda, Bangalore, Delhi, Hyderabad, Kalpakam, Kolhapur, Nagpur, Pune, Rurki and Nellore. IFSA's main aim and objectives are taking science to masses, developing a scientific temper in the society, understanding the problem of women in science, sharing knowledge and professional competence, being a scientific body of women in science and technology, promoting a scientific accomplishment among women scientists. Our this talk is a part of this commitment by the webinar series that is science and our life. I now request our president, Dr. Lalita Dhareshwar, who is a cool, loving, energetic physicist, and I don't know what all I can add to it, our loving president, Dr. Lalita Dhareshwar, to talk about her baby, <laughs> the science and our life. Yes, Lalita. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Madhu. And uh, it is indeed my great pleasure, uh, Dr. Abhay Vaidya and uh, Dr. Supriya, to welcome you to this uh, gathering. Uh, where we, you know, it's a very special uh, uh, webinar series that uh, we started about a year back uh, when we all kind of uh, got stuck at our homes and we could not visit our premises at Ilza, where all the other events used to take place in the past. And we used to have our lectures, refresher courses and uh, workshops for the students, for faculty of colleges. And so many initiatives and so many activities used to be there. And the moment the coronavirus stepped in, we were all uh, kind of driven inside our homes and uh, we've been staying there. And it start, we started thinking how we can utilize our time in the best possible manner. And this digital technology came to our rescue. And uh, we started this uh, online uh, webinars on uh, you know, it's this series is called Science and Our Life. And as the name suggests, there is a, such a close association between science and life. I mean, everything around you is uh, science, basically. Everything goes on in a very meticulous manner based on very precise scientific principles. In fact, we have, we have been seeing life all our lives that we have taken everything around us for granted. But if we pause and look at every small thing that is around us, you will find so many principles of science coming in the, behind this, you know, being which lies behind this. 
And uh, it, many a times we try to wonder, we try to answer, we try to ask these questions. How does this work or how does that work? And we don't many a times get the required answers. So this uh, particular series of science and our life makes sure that we call experts from various fields, from education, from health, from uh, you know uh, uh, various kinds of sciences, technology, social sciences, and even uh, bankers. We have called them to give us lectures and entrepreneurs. And uh, we find that there is a very close uh, knit principle in all these, you know, it's th there is a basis of science which lies behind everything that we see around us. And when you come to know that it is so beautiful and makes us so happy. And when our knowledge and understanding increases in these things around us, it really gives you a sense of fulfillment. And I have always wondered, you know, what is uh, what is really anesthesia? How does it work? And when uh, you think about the our uh, the olden, uh, you know, few centuries back when human beings had to suffer so much of pain because anesthesia was not known at that time, what a blessing it is to mankind, you know, modern medicine. And when Dr. Um, Sunita Mahajan told me that uh, Dr. Abhay Vaidya is uh, ready to give a talk on uh, uh, anesthesia and evolution and the history of uh, anesthesia. I was really excited and I'm sure all of you here who are to there today would be really waiting to hear him speak because uh, we all would like to know and understand what really happens when a person is subjected to anesthesia. And where does a, okay, you are unconscious and our consciousness on the physical level is not there, but what happens to that consciousness? I mean, why is it? And what makes us really not recognize the pain, you know, which is uh, happening or inflicted on the body because of medical reasons. So all these uh, mysteries would be unraveled today by Dr. Abhay Vaidya and uh, I'm very, very happy to have him and Dr. Supriya to introduce him to the audience today. Thank you. Madhu, you can please take over. Thank you, Lalita. For by this series, you are not only getting your queries solved, even we are benefited. Thank you so much for that. Now, I would like to introduce another guest and our loving family member, Dr. Supriya Gajedkar. She is a consultant anesthetist, anesthesiology in PD Hinduja Hospital and Medical Research Center, Mumbai. Since the past 18 years, Dr. Supriya is one of the family member of Dr. Sunita Mahajan. She has been awarded as a gold medalist during her education and all the degrees. Now, I would like to call you, Dr. Supriya, to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Abhay Vaidya. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madhu, madam, for your kind introduction. I'll just share my screen. Can you see now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Madhu, madam. I'm immensely thankful to you, sir, to give me this wonderful opportunity to introduce today's esteemed guest speaker, Dr. Abhay Vaidya. Dr. Abhay Vaidya was born in Panji in a family of doctors, that is Vaidyas. He graduated in medicine from the Goa Medical College, one of the oldest medical schools in India. After graduation, he pursued his studies in the speciality of anesthesia from Goa, and he stood second at the University of Bombay in his diploma in anesthesia examination. Then he went ahead and did MD anesthesiology from Tata Memorial Hospital, Bombay. 
he was also the first goan student to complete his pg fellowship in cardiothoracic and neurosurgery anesthesia from the very prestigious shri chitra tirunal institute of medical sciences and technology trivandrum after which he returned to goa he joined goa medical college as a consultant anesthetist in 1989 dr abhay decided to study further and after a short stint in middle east as a consultant anesthetist he joined the national health service that is the nhs in the uk as a registrar in anesthetics after being awarded his fellowship of the royal college of anesthetists that is frca he worked as a consultant anesthetist in nhs for nearly 15 years prior to his retirement imparting knowledge is the noblest of all professions so even after his retirement dr abhay was very keen in teaching and sharing his vast knowledge and experience so in 2016 he joined the newly started medical school at the university of central lancashire as a communication skill portfolio and problem based learning tutor he then studied for pg certificate in medical education and was awarded the prestigious fellowship of higher education academy in his career dr abhay has been a mbbs examiner for various universities in uk he is also examined nurses and paramedics and also he has been an examiner of the royal college of surgeons of england and has examined candidates all over uk as well as overseas he also has been a college tutor for the royal college of anesthetists and a member of fitness to practice interim orders and recertification appeal panel of the general medical council which is a professional regulatory body for all the uk doctors dr vaidya has published widely in several peer reviewed journals and has also co-authored a book chapter he has also presented papers at several <coughs> national and international scientific conferences as i also know him personally i would like to add that he is a very generous kind hearted human being and he is a very supportive and loving husband and a father his son is also a doctor in uk and thus continuing his family tradition of vaidyas so i would like to now invite dr vaidya to deliver his talk thank you supriya ji i intervene here i see another speaker coming for us maybe in due course that is dr supriya as she has a you know experience of working in so many hospitals of bombay that is lokmanya tilak she has worked in tata hospital she has worked in rajeja hospital potis hospital and she has keen interest in cardiovascular and thoracic anesthesia very interesting to know i'm getting curious to know one day i hope you will give one lecture on Definitely. your i'll be honored thank you so yes, much yes we are delighted to have you now thank you thank request, you so much yeah i uh, request now dr abhay ji to start his lecture thank you thank you let me get along with the technology now and hopefully if i can work it out right i hope you can see the presentation thank you dr supriya for your kind words and in introducing me i also would love to thank the indian women scientists association president dr ladita dareswar dr rita and members of the it team i won't forget you madhu ji but uh, i love to disappoint some of you because i'm not going to tell you this at this lecture give away my secrets of how an aesthetic works so probably supriya or somebody else can come and give them as a magician don't tell the secrets in this one i'm not going to share any of my secrets i also would like to thank dr sunita mahajan who is my cousin sister as she has already has been referred to last but not the least thank you all for those of you who have decided not to view any of your favorite tv series or today is the wimbledon's ladies final 
and uh, isusa had decided to have hold my lecture on the day i hope that it was not an intentional one during the face to face talk i generally can see how my audience reacts and as a professional anesthetist i have tried all throughout my career to keep people their mouth shut and fall asleep i intend to do the reverse today i would like to make sure that you are awake and for those who fall asleep i hope i can make uh, wake you up with good memories at the end of the day so for those of you who may not be there by the end fall asleep or uh, decide to leave it i decided that i'll thank you right at the beginning for being with me as the title suggests it's just a peek into the history of anesthesia is nothing much more detail and try to make it less boring because most of us as students i'm sure we remember the way history classes the dates and the what happened and what not happened and, and so i've tried to keep it very short and try to be keep it entertaining history of anesthesia although recent we all know that our great indian physician Shushrut was known as the father of modern surgery, and he is also known as the first plastic surgeon. Many of his techniques that have been described are apparently still practiced today. And as you can see, this is how apparently Shushrut practices surgery. Now, as you can see, it still depicts the same thing. We have a nurse assistant or an assistant trying to help him and we have the other two assistant trying to help is so that the patient is kept quiet or patient is made comfortable no one knows how these patients were anesthetized in those days but the secrets were probably not shared but general anesthesia the anesthetic technique i've divided for the talk of this talk into five different parts vocal tocal focal local and general it's not a chronological way but basically let's talk about it vocal anesthesia it was anesthetists or the most doctors are good at saying ay kuch nahi hoga hilo mat it's not going to hurt you it's only a small prick but basically everybody knows a small needle also hurts especially when you don't want to have it if somebody is not anesthetized by these kind soothing words of kuch nahi hoga then it gets slightly more we have to increase the level of anesthesia eh hey, hilo mat don't move do you understand so that is how the vocal anesthesia works focal anesthesia is obviously we have these two gentlemen here assisting the surgeon trying to do that and then imagine the surgery that would have been carried out pre anesthetic days as it was referred to you have the people holding the patient down because those were the days when there were no anesthesia available and i'm sure not many of us would have wanted to be a patient during this time tocal anesthesia those who have had the fortune or misfortune of being having an operation done in the private practice many times they will say that oh the anesthetist hasn't arrived the babatli wala he is probably anesthetizing at some other hospital he will arrive he will arrive so you see that right from the ancient days we the anesthetists have a tradition of keeping the patients and the surgeons waiting for us just to improve our importance and show how important a specialty we are and this is the traditional way how the anesthetists have been depicted however in the modern days the anesthetists not only put patient to sleep but most importantly they are taught how to wake the patient up safely at the end of the surgery so they wake the patient safely without any major damage brain damage and or any other damage and pain free as well so after vocal focal tocal let's talk about little bit about local anesthesia it has well been known that cold causes pain freeness 
it numbs the nerves. My apologies for the next couple of slides. Some of you may not like to view them. They are quite depicted of some of the gangrenes of the frostbite which results in the gangrene. And then it was noticed by the surgeon of Napoleon Bonaparte that during the war, some many of his soldiers who were injured in the war field in a temperature of minus 19 degrees centigrade in snow apparently did not feel the pain. They were quite relatively comfortable, not howling, crying. And he realized that cold could be used as an anesthetic. So he started using cold as an anesthetic and then People had their amputations during the war using cold as an anesthetic. The picture shows of ethyl chloride. Some of you might remember having been anesthetized with ethyl chloride. I don't know whether it is available nowadays in India, but in the UK at least it has stopped. It is not available because of the environmental concerns. But ethyl chloride is a cold. It evaporates and causes intense cold during which a minor surgical operation such as incision of an abscess at the limb or any periphery could have been carried out. But it's not available anymore now. But the awareness that cold can cause anesthesia has been known and it has been used, cold or the cryosurgery has been used even in the modern days, the amputation, mainly for the amputation. There has been a series there as well. And personally, I can encounter one patient that we anesthetized when I was a senior resident in Goa. This was the patient who needed amputation for diabetes, but his blood sugar was uncontrollable. And we just could not get it because infection increases the blood sugar. And as long as he had an infected gangrenous lower limb, his blood sugar could not be controlled and he was considered too dangerous or too unfit to have general anesthesia. So my professor, late Dr. R. N. Shetty, suggested we carry out the amputation using cold anesthesia. As happens in India, patients or relatives were asked to get a slab of cold. His thigh was covered into the slab of ice, crushed ice for about an hour, hour and a half. And when he could know no more feel his numb pain and the, the surgeon carried out a successful amputation. I can still remember that incident and I'm glad to report that the patient survived and even was discharged. More seriously, the concept of local anesthesia attracted even the surgeons. And James Young Simpson was an obstetrician from Edinburgh who came out or who thought about this, how wonderful it would be if certain operations could be carried out under local anesthesia. And he came to these thoughts because he had used ether, to which we'll refer later on in the subsequent talk. But he found that the ether causes too much of nausea and vomiting. So he wasn't very happy. And that is why he dreamt about local anesthesia. Besides cold, it is well known that pressure can also numb the nerves and the pressure anesthesia, as you might see, causes something known as the Saturday night palsy. The name Saturday night palsy, it comes from the fact that in many of the European countries, I don't know whether this is probably in Europe or England or USA, but people used to go out, or they still go out nowadays every day, but on a Saturday night, drink excessive alcohol, come home and slump on the chair or the sofa or the couch with a hair hand hanging. That resulted into their nerves into the armpit being numbed and compressed and pressed till the person, the individual woke up the next morning by which time his nerve had resulted into the palsy and there is to have a wrist drop. 
So the concept of pressure and cold were known for some time, although they were not general and aesthetically they were not there. But today, we have much better ways of giving the local anesthesia or the regional anesthesia, as we call it. Today's anesthetists learn about the nerve supply and we have specific local anesthetic drugs which numb the nerves so that with the knowledge of how the anatomy of the body, where the nerves and how the muscles are innervated, limbs are innervated, spinal cords flow out of the spinal canal, anesthetists can identify the precise nerves nowadays with ultrasound as well and localize and numb those nerves so we get a local anesthetic area. And one of the commonest of that is obviously epidural, which I'll refer to there. The concept of local anesthetic drug came because it was realized that cocaine leaves or the cocoa leaves used to produce numbness of the tongue. Karl Kohler was a German ophthalmologist and he was working with Dr. Sigmund Freud, who later became the famous psychiatrist. While working with Dr. Sigmund Freud, they realized that cocoa or cocaine could be used to have for the local anesthetic effect on the mucous membrane, such as the mouth and the tongue. So they used the local drops of cocaine and Carl Kohler operated the first glaucoma operation under local anesthetic on the 11th of the September, yes, 9-11, 1884. However, cocaine is very, very unstable and leads to addiction. And with no control drugs laws at that time, many of the doctors got themselves addicted. Cocaine paste was still used for the nasal surgery, when the, again in the UK it has become very difficult now, but you could have the a tape or a cotton piece or something which was soaked into the cocaine paste and that was pushed along the nostrils to anesthetize the nostril and the ENT surgeon would operate onto the septum of the nose or do some other minor surgeries under cocaine anesthesia. But as cocaine became more difficult and then people realized the side effect, the 20th century procaine was developed and then in 1943 lidocaine was synthesized, lignocaine or the lidocaine. And now subsequently there have been a few more drugs and we use these drugs for the local anesthesia. One of the biggest advantages of local anesthesia is that we're much safer than general anesthesia because the patient is awake. Not only can he support the surgeon, but he also knows if the, whether it's hurting or not. And sometimes certain neurosurgical procedures are carried out under local anesthesia so that the surgeon can identify the precise area of the brain where a very delicate operation needs to be performed. So as we saw with Professor Simpson, he was interested in local anesthesia and being an obstetrician, he wanted to make use of anesthetic technique to relieve labor pain. But being a religious country, those who believed in the Bible were damn against having obstetric anesthesia or the labor anesthesia until such time that we had a spinal anesthetic. The first planned spinal anesthetic was administered by August Baer on Bayer or Baer, B-I-E-R, again a German surgeon, on the 16th August 1998. And it was interesting how these people or the pioneers as we call them worked in those days. There was no thing like ethical approval, no phase one, phase two, phase three trial. Whenever they thought that they could use something, they could just use it. And what Dr. August Bayer did was he injected three ml of 0.5% cocaine solution into a 34 year old laborer for the operation. 
after using it on six patient successfully he and his assistant injected cocaine into each other's spine to identify how it works and how do they feel what a strange world doctors not only anesthetizing their patient but having the experiment on themselves to see how the patients feel after the spinal anesthetic messi dawkins performed the first epidural anesthesia anesthesia of the regional anesthesia in 1942 so since then epidural anesthesia for labor has become increasingly common and much more demanded it's not only during labor but it can be successfully used during the cesarean section as well as in many other operation more or less any operation below the belly button or the umbilicus you can more or less safely perform under spinal or the epidural anesthetic that brings us to the one of the last stages of anesthesia which all you might be interested in is general anesthesia now general anesthesia as i said during the days of susrut nobody knew how we operated about it could be just a local anesthetic but after that somewhere whatever the skills that were were lost traditionally people have used over the centuries before the birth of formal anesthetic drugs and medications people use opium they might have also used hypnosis psychotherapy or whatever that may be there obviously in china acupuncture has a long last history of using during surgery the research paper or observational studies where people coming from the west they have seen acupuncture being used for termination of pregnancy or dnc's and most people laughed and jokingly said oh no it's a communist country they just ladies just accept the pain but recently last month or so i had seen a video obviously via the whatsapp where an open heart surgery is being performed using the acupuncture and little bit of sedation which took me by surprise anyway talking to the traditional methods one of the drugs or the medicines that has been used over the centuries has been this one alcohol it's well known that for centuries alcohol was used with or without the opium or different concoction to keep the patient sedated this picture reflects another anesthetic technique what is known as the mandrake leaves along with the black nightshade poppies and other herbs used to be boiled together and cooked into a sponge the sponge which in included scopolamine and morphine was then reconstituted in the hot water and placed on the patient's nose prior to surgery this happened somewhere between 9th and the 13th century but yet these were not controlled drugs not controlled methods secrets were kept by the individuals to themselves or shared with very few so it was not a anesthetic practice as we would say today imagine the agony if you had to undergo such a procedure no doubt that these patients although they were given opium alcohol or whatever other concoction many a time they just fainted and then we come to this gentleman nitrous oxide as you might know might have heard about it as a laughing gas was first produced by joseph priestley in 1772 however like the chemist he was not interested in using it his goal was different so he did not pursue it as an anesthetic sir humphrey davy in 1799 further investigated it and it is said that in trying to inhale the gas he almost died 
He is known to have used it to relieve his toothache, but he never saw it as a root or as a medication or as an anesthetic. So nitrous oxide also was known to give pain relief, was never used for pain relief as an anesthetic. But it was rather used in the social circles to have some fun, to have that euphoria. And I'm not surprised and you won't be surprised that that use of nitrous oxide still continues. This is a small demonstration and I must warn you that it is illegal to use nitrous oxide for such recreational purposes but you know why it is called the laughing gas. All right guys, I'm gonna do nitrous oxide laughing gas for your entertainment. <laughs> So, that's the small demonstration of nitrous oxide. And it is for these properties that nitrous oxide was used in the social circles, upper middle class, high classes, for having fun during the social gatherings. So the use was known, or the mis as we call it, as a misuse was known, but not its anesthetic properties. Garden Colton was a medical student in USA and he wanted to become a doctor but during the medicine he I think he was a dental student during the medicine studies he came across nitrous oxide in effect and decided that he would hold public lectures showing the effects of nitrous oxide and giving talk about it with his first lecture or the first tour itself, we collected $535, $535, somewhere in 1850s or 1844, I think. And then decided not to pursue his medical studies or dental studies, but rather to continue this circus of demonstrating the nitrous oxide. On the 10th of December, 1844, he gave one such performance in Hartford in Connecticut, but which one of the audience had another dentist known as Horace Wales. Now during the performance, what happened was what Colton used to do is to demonstrate, to demonstrate the effect of nitrous oxide. He used to ask the members of the audience to come onto the stage and ask them to breathe. And as you saw in the earlier video, these people, when they had inhaled the nitrous oxide, used to behave in a very funny measures, laugh and make people laugh and entertain the other audiences. So during this performance, where Horace Wales was one was in audience, he noticed that one of the performers damaged his leg, but he did not even realize, he did not react. To, I think he fractured his leg, but did not even react to that. And that gave him the idea or the thought that it could be used as a general anesthetic for tooth extraction. So obviously he negotiated with Colton and he got a sample of the gas. When we acquired the sample of the gas, Dr. Wales used it on himself for his tooth extraction. So he had his tooth extracted, 
to see whether it is hurt so it does not and when it did not hurt him he thought he had found the eureka moment which he did so he rushed to the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston in 1845 and he gave a public demonstration into their operation theater and as you would see in the subsequent slides operation theaters in those days where they were it was like an amphitheater it was a theater medical students other faculty members literally sat in the tiered operation theater like you see it in the commercial theater the surgeon operated and people and public even the public could attend the operations so when dr horace wells gave them demonstration for the operation the patient vincent supposedly said ah when his tooth was extracted so all the students shouted the audience shouted saying that this is a humbug this is a humbug this is a humbug. Remember the word humbug. Apparently, the patient later confessed that although he had uttered the word ah, he had never felt the pain. He does not remember that, but that did not matter. Dr. Horace Wells was stamped as a humbug man. He lost the interest. He tried to get into chloroform as an anesthetic. But basically, he went into depression. He got addicted to chloroform, was jailed for throwing sulfuric acid on two prostitutes when under the influence of chloroform. And when in jail, he committed suicide by cutting his artery again under the influence of chloroform. So he said, and to Dr. Horace Wells. On the contrary, Colton tried to, he succeeded, and he's supposed to have had a very flourishing dental practice and supposed to have anesthetized thousands of patients with nitrous oxide. However, the credit does not go to him. The credit of the father of modern day anesthesia is one William Thomas Green Martin. He was another dentist. And he, like many others, he too in those days was interested in finding a magic drug or whatever potion which could be used as an anesthetic and people could feel no pain as a dentist because dentist people have to go there and it, the dental care is not good probably in those days. So they had to have tooth extraction very often and he wanted to look after his patients very well. So. So on September 30, 1846, Morton performed a painless tooth extraction after administering ether to a patient. So he was experimenting with different drugs. He found ether probably would work. He managed to anesthetize a patient using ether and extracted the tooth. So this was the operation theater demonstration of Morton's anesthetic. We will refer, come to that. So when Morton had extracted a tooth or treated his patient using ether that became a news and when that news was flashed across the boston newspaper he was invited to give a demonstration of his anesthetic again as a massachusetts general hospital on the 16th of october 1846 the story goes that he was almost late because he was trying to perfect his apparatus of giving the anesthetic to this patient worked throughout the night and he rushed to the operation theater where the surgeon was waiting. And as I said, an operation theater in those days was where all everybody came, sat, they were watching you. And the surgeon was John Collins Warren, who removed a painless muscular malformation from the neck of one patient called Edward Gilbert Abbott after he was anesthetized by Dr. Morton using ether. So that day, his demonstration was a great success. And referring to the failure of nitrous oxide demonstration just about a year or two ago, earlier, 
the famous quote goes gentlemen this is no humbug so this day of 18th october is now it is celebrated all, all over the world as a world anesthesia day this is the replica of the anesthetic apparatus which was used to and give the first ether anesthetic which is now the has been the modern anesthetic machine it is the precursor of modern anesthetic machine as you see today the news of this successful anesthetic in boston reached england in those days it was the transatlantic ship so from new york somebody traveled to liverpool and from liverpool went to london and on the 19th of december 1846 Francis Booth, an American botanist, he watched a dental surgeon James Robinson administer the first and ether anesthetic in England. Two days later, Robert Liston operated on Frederick Churchill at the University College Hospital, and a medical student, William Squire, administered the anesthetic. As an anesthetic, I think that as an anesthetist, I think that was the day when the surgeon realized because the anesthetist was a student, he could start dictating the anesthetist. It's a tongue in cheek remark. Apologies to any surgeons who may be present there. But basically, this is the blue plaque which has been erected. In England, you have the blue plaque of the most important. Some, events which are there and then the the blue plaque society erects the blue plaque to identify the place where that event took place so this is the plaque where the first anesthetic was given the building doesn't exist now there's a new building on that place earlier i had referred to sir james simpson who was a prominent obstetrician in edinburgh he too tried heard of the ether anesthetic and tried to use ether anesthetic to his pregnant ladies and during his surgery. However, ether causes, as I said, a lot of nausea and vomiting, and he wasn't very happy. He then started, attempted to start with chloroform. The story goes that, again, when he had a chloroform, he invited a couple of his friends at his house in Edinburgh, they had a good fun. Each one of them inhaled anesthetic chloroform and woke up the next morning. So they didn't realize that the chloroform was a very powerful anesthetic at that time. But as I referred earlier, because of the religious ethical reasons, there was still a strong resistance for pain relief during labor. It fell to London physician John Snow, who anesthetized Queen Victoria on April the 7th, 1853, during the delivery of her eight child Leopold, using chloroform during to relieve her pain during labor. That success led to he giving the same and labor anesthesia or the labor of pain-free uh, chloroform for pain-free labor during the birth of her next daughter in 1857 as well. This successful demonstration helped to change the public perception and obstetric anesthesia became accepted. You must have been a lucky man here because chloroform is not a very good anesthetic. Chloroform causes cardiac arrhythmias or the irregularity of the heart and soon chloroform fell into disuse and became back to ether. However, despite all these advantages, ether was widely used. Until such time that sodium barbiturate was discovered by the Abbott laboratories. So for the first time, anesthetist or the surgeons working with their colleagues and the assistant could find a drug 
that could be given intravenously and that is where we came to this famous concept of countdown 9998 whatever that is that to realize when the patient goes to sleep sodium thiopental or barbiturate it is said that it killed more american soldiers than the japanese attack on the pearl harbor the reason for that is when the sodium barbiturate was discovered people didn't realize its side effect that it remains in the body for far, far too long so people used to give the sodium barbiturate anesthetize the patient and when the surgery was done during surgery patient starts moving give little bit of more sodium barbiturate give little bit when the surgery was over the surgeon left pain was gone and these patients went to sleep again because the barbiturates still remain in the body and then they obstructed and died so that is why the saying that sodium barbiturate killed more american soldiers than the japanese bombs did however this dawn this sodium barbiturate was also known as the truth serum used widely during the psychiatric treatment of the electrical shock to the brain ect and until recently it was the drug of choice used during killing of patients or the prisoners death sentences of prisoners in the usa however many drug companies stopped producing it the usa could not get the adequate supply of barbiturates and i think they started losing looking at the alternative solutions the other problem with the sodium barbiturate and with mainly with the ether anesthesia was patients were breathing spontaneously with ether anesthesia which when the surgeon found it difficult to operate onto the abdomen because anything you do, the patients were breathing in and out and in and out and the organs used to move in and out of their field. So they wanted a technique by which if the anesthetist could keep the patients, stop their breathing. So there came this plant. You might have heard of poison arrows. So when the Spaniards went into the Americas, today's America, Central America, and the south they found that certain tribes were using poison arrows to keep kill the animal but the interesting intriguing thing was that when the animal was dead people humans could eat it it did not poison the human being and they didn't know what the poison was until eventually some of them managed to get the extract of that poison back and analyze that is where they found that it was the curare it's extract curare which works at the junction of the nerves and the muscles and it stops firing of the nerve impulses into the muscles so that is why the animal or the human being stops breathing if a patient or the if that paralyzed patient is then ventilated his breathing is continued after a certain period of time the drug wears off and then the spontaneous breathing starts so that is the concept how we the anesthetist intubate the patient put the tube down the breathing tube using some modern drugs curare is no longer used also i had the fortune of using it during my early days but it's no longer used because of the plenty of side effects and we have better drugs but we paralyze them using the muscle relaxant and maintain the breathing during the operation and then we stop that or reverse the effect of the drug patient starts breathing the breathing tube comes out after thiopental because it has its side effects many other intravenous anesthetic came but the most recent and the commonly used drug is this magic milk also known as the propofol 
late 90s it was released and nowadays it is more or less the most popular drug in fact it is so safe that you can have a continuous infusion of propofol to anesthetize a patient for as long as you want with some painkillers and there's the new skills or the technique known as TIVA, total intravenous anesthesia, is being used. No doubt, compared to propofol, because it lasts shorter, there are less side effects, patients don't die, and because you don't use the anesthetic or the intubation and other thing, it is safer to a certain extent, but in the good hand, it also improved the productivity and the concept of day surgery became a reality mainly thanks to propofol and some other improved anesthetic drugs. Over the years, the role of anesthetists has expanded. They have taken over more and more expertise and their expertise and the knowledge of physiology, pharmacology and the overall skills of airway management meant that anesthetists, according to the UK study, are involved in almost two-thirds of the patient care in a hospital and admitted patient directly or indirectly. So the anesthetists are involved in nearly two-thirds of patient care that is provided in the hospitals in the UK. This is the precursor of ventilator known as the iron lung. Iron lung was invented in the early 1900s and the early 1900 something. It was there so to help the patient to breathe. Because when we normally breathe, we generally suck in the air because the diaphragm moves down and creates a negative pressure into our lungs so the air is sucked in and it was thought that the patients who have difficulty in breathing would be helped to create that so in the so-called iron lung this is my colleague this is an example but this is my colleague my next door neighbor who is a doctor a retired physician and anyway you create a put the patient into air sealed chamber and create the negative pressure so the lung expands and then you bring it back to zero so respiration is maintained however as you can see it is extremely difficult to look after the patient all the needs of the patient so it was not very common however it was the concept of ventilators as we know today had the biggest impetus and the positive pressure ventilation because of the 1952 Copenhagen polio epidemic. Just as we now have seen in all over the world, and you might have experienced it in India and in Mumbai as well, when the epidemic strikes, the services are stretched. And in this 52 Copenhagen polio epidemic, people with polio started coming to the hospitals and many of them were having breathing difficulties because of the polio. One of the surgeons that who had recently come from the USA decided that these patients could be kept alive by doing a tracheotomy that is a hole in the neck, but then they did not have the ventilators. They did not have adequate number of iron lungs nor did they have the concept of ventilator wasn't there because it was thought that a positive pressure ventilation where you pump the air rather than allowing the air to be sucked into the lung where you pump the air into the lung would do more damage but what he realized was if he could intubate keep the patients alive by doing the positive pressure ventilation patient could be kept alive till the polio episode subsided and they came out of that infection not everyone but those but they didn't have the ventilators so what they did in this copenhagen polio epidemic it's well known that they employed medical and the dental student and the nurses after just a couple of hours of training and these students were paid one pound fifty or something for an eight hour shift in those days it may be variable somebody told me it was one shilling in those days i don't know 
but medical students were manually sitting by the side of the patients and squeezing the bag, keeping the patient alive. And they did it in eight hour shift. The only breaks that the students got was for their cigarettes. So when they wanted to go for the break for the lunch or for the toilets breaks or whatever that is that. So they did it and the success mortality came down significantly. So that was the impetus or the stimulus to start developing more and more ventilators. And we started at having a different companies get taking in. Over the time, anesthetists got involved, obviously, into this. And that is the how today's intensive care unit was born. So in the UK, and I suppose even in India, many of the, the most of the intensive care units, but I use my word. In UK, it is most. In, you, in India, I don't know. But the anesthetists are involved in the management of the intensive care units. They are involved in the management of trauma when the patient comes to accident and emergency or the casualty department. They are involved in the management of any acute patient accidents whenever it comes. And they are also involved in the safe transfer of the patient either by ambulance or via the air transport or anything. So, if the anesthetists are involved into all these things, yet in spite of that, we are always worried about safety of anesthesia. And the biggest question is, doctor, will I die? Or doctor, will I wake up again? Because when somebody loses the consciousness, they not only lose the consciousness, they also lose ability to breathe, as we saw and the ability to maintain their blood pressure, ability control over their bowel, bladder, and other vitals. So it is the job of the anesthetist to monitor their heart signs, their blood pressure, obviously their oxygenation, and any other signs that there may be their fluid levels, electrolyte, blah, blah, you talk about it. So while this is happening in the background for a patient, the biggest worry is, doctor, will I die? Or will I be a makeup safe? So how safe is general anesthetic? As far as the UK is concerned, the chances of death in a road traffic accident in the UK is one in 100,000, is one in 20,000. Or the lifetime risk is one in 240. But how does it compare to safety in anesthesia? Safety in anesthesia in UK, taking all the anesthetics, is obviously one death per 100,000 to 185,000. So from compared to one in 20,000, you can see that the chances of death or the risk of death is about eight to times eight to nine times or 10 times, depending upon what figure you take, five to 10 times more riskier to drive a car in UK than to have a general anesthetic. When it, I used to do the preoperative and assessment for my anesthetic patient, that was one of the commonest questions asked, how safe will I wake up? And I used to had to tell them that statistically, you are more likely to die when you walk out of the hospital onto the road than die in the anesthetic theater. So that brings us to the end of that. So next time, if at all you have to visit the operation theater or you have to visit any of the other colleagues of ours, please remember that that is the guy who keeps you awake at that time. Everybody wonders what anesthetists do while the patient is asleep. Everybody wonders what we do for three hours while that machine goes beep. Everybody reckons we drink coffee and we gossip and we're generally subversive. Everybody reckons we do crosswords and Sudoku and we chat up all the nurses. 
think that's all we do Well let me tell you now it isn't true Cause we sometimes check the screen And every now and then we write stuff And if we have to intervene We inject a bit of white stuff And we offer to alter the lights Or the height of the bed Or fiddle with the radio Change the CD We even check the patients occasionally And if they move We turn up the vapour And then we go back To reading the paper Cause when the patients asleep We just sit and listen to the beef We just sit and listen to the Once upon a time I took pride in my job Now I think it's time to depart Cause I just sit here every day And listen to blips of the heart So next time You come across an anesthetist Think about him I don't know how many of you will remember the anesthetist but you probably will remember your surgeon. So don't forget the anesthetist. Thank you very much.